Today on Newswatch, Donald Trump's practical approach. Why some say his possible picks for energy secretary could lead America to energy independence. Plus, VidAngel targeted in court. Why the Disney company and others are trying to shut down the clean video service. And it's being called Mel Gibson's big comeback. But he tells CBN News he didn't know he was gone. We sit down with the Hollywood director for the latest on his faith and career. Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Mark Martin. Some unexpected names are being floated for key posts in Donald Trump's potential cabinet. The possible picks may give us a clue as to how he intends to run the country. They're fueling the debate. Is Trump a pragmatist or a conservative ideologue? Gary Lane has the latest. As outgoing President Barack Obama made his final overseas trip as president, starting in Greece, incoming President Donald Trump pondered his potential cabinet picks. Just before leaving on his trip, President Obama held a press conference where he said that Trump was committed to NATO and he was asked about his impressions of the president-elect. I don't think he is ideological. Uh, I think ultimately is he's pragmatic in that way. Uh, and uh, that can serve him well. Trump's latest potential cabinet picks may demonstrate a pragmatic business approach to move the country forward. On the campaign trail, Trump pledged to approve the Keystone Pipeline and said he'd take steps to make the U.S. energy independent. Some of those being considered to head up the Department of Energy would help him accomplish that. Among them, North Dakota Congressman Kevin Kramer. North Dakota has become one of the nation's top oil producing states. Oklahoma oil tycoon Harold Hamm. The billionaire's Continental Resources Company is involved in shale oil fracking. Also considered for head of the Department of Energy or Interior is venture capitalist Robert Grady. Grady previously worked in the Bush administration, but the potential big surprise may be Trump's potential pick for Secretary of State, America's top diplomat. For now, it appears to be Trump supporter and friend Rudy Giuliani, a former federal prosecutor. Many people thought Giuliani would be appointed U.S. Attorney General, or possibly head of Homeland Security. But Trump reportedly told the former New York City mayor he can have any cabinet position he wants. And Trump may appoint gay Republican Richard Grinnell to be ambassador to the United Nations. Grinnell is a foreign policy expert and the longest serving U.S. spokesman at the U.N. Still to come, who the president-elect will choose for the important posts of Secretary of Defense, Intelligence, Homeland Security, and Treasury. And once his cabinet is firmed up, Trump will have another important personnel decision to make. Who will replace the late Antonin Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court? Trump has vowed to appoint pro-life justices and judges, those who may potentially overturn Roe v. Wade. If it ever were overturned, it would go back to the states. So but it would go back to the states. Some women states. won't be able to get an abortion. No, it'll go back to the states. By state? No, some... Yeah. Well, they'll perhaps have to, go to want... another, they'll have to go to another state. Gary Lane, CBN News. After their big election loss, Democrats are on the hunt for a new leader, and many are pushing for a serious change in the party's positions. They want to focus more on their base and winning back the white working class voters who went for Donald Trump. We have to do a lot of rethinking. Democrats have focused too much uh, with a liberal elite, which is raising incredible sums of money from wealthy people. Democrats have to choose a new leader of the party's national committee. One leading candidate is Muslim Congressman Keith Ellison of Minnesota. But others are looking to get into the race as well. Some liberals are pushing the party to move even more to the left. Democrats lost the White House along with the House and Senate under President Obama, along with governorships and state legislatures. The Washington State Supreme Court will hear the case today of a Christian florist who declined to provide flowers for a gay wedding. Baronel Stutzman owns Arlene's Flowers. A lower court judge ruled last year that she violated an anti-discrimination law. The two gay men who are suing Stutzman are being represented by the ACLU. They argue that businesses open to the public have an obligation to serve everyone. But Stutzman says they're trying to force her to think the way they think or be destroyed. The Oregon public official who levied a $135,000 fine against a Christian-owned bakery lost his bid to become Oregon's Secretary of State. Since 2008, Brad Avakian has been the commissioner of the Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries. 
He ruled Sweet Cakes by Melissa must pay the fine after the bakery refused to provide a wedding cake for a lesbian couple. The owners said it would violate their Christian beliefs. In the Oregon Secretary of State race, Avakian lost to former state representative Dennis Richardson. The Daily Caller reports that Richardson will become the first Republican in 14 years to win a statewide office in Oregon. Turning overseas as Iraqi armed forces battle to force ISIS out of Mosul, the terror group is fighting hard to keep its hold on the city. ISIS has lit oil wells and a chemical plant on fire near Mosul, creating a toxic smoke screen that has sickened more than 1,500 people in the area. And as Chris Mitchell reports, many new refugees are fleeing for their lives. Already thousands of refugees have tried to escape the ISIS rampage across Iraq. It's a trickle that could become a flood. Behind me is one of the many refugee camps throughout northern Iraq. 20,000 people live in this one alone, with another 30,000 in the vicinity. But experts warn when the city of Mosul falls, it could represent the greatest refugee crisis in decades. There's a lot of potential for this to be catastrophic on the human scale. Matthew Nowry leads Samaritan's Purse in northern Iraq. He says the internally displaced persons, or IDPs, coming out of Mosul today are different from the refugees who fled ISIS in the summer of 2014. The IDPs that are going to be coming out of Mosul have lived two plus years under the control of ISIS. And so they've seen what I believe is the worst terrorism the world has ever seen. And they have been um, influenced by ISIS. He says that makes this humanitarian effort far more dangerous. When you talk about a million plus people being displaced all over the desert here in Iraq, um, it, it doesn't take long for you to understand that there will be uh, ISIS cells in those groups of people, in those groupings, which brings in a whole new set of challenges. Despite the danger, he sees the crisis as an opportunity for the church, especially with the young people. These youth have been watching ISIS for the last two years. And they know what they're being taught by ISIS. And they're about to be displaced into the region. And they're going to be watching to see who receives them and who serves them. And so we have taken it upon ourselves as an organization. And we believe that uh, Jesus commands us to give a glass of cold water to our enemy and to serve. And so we want to be there. We want to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ when these children and when these adults, whether it is cells of ISIS or not. Nowry says what's needed most now is prayer. The situation is incredibly complex. And I'd ask the church back in America, in the West, first and foremost to pray. We don't have all of the answers. We don't know how to remain completely secure. This is a dangerous calling. But I'd ask for prayers for the people themselves that are going to be displaced, that God would soften their hearts now, that they'd be receptive to the message that so many of Jesus' followers are going to be out in the desert here in Iraq trying to provide. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Northern Iraq. Israel will soon begin a major three-year-long expedition in the Judean Desert to look for more Dead Sea Scrolls. It is the first large-scale archaeological survey of the area in more than 20 years. Looters found manuscripts there in recent years, which prompted the government to begin looking for more. The Israel Antiquities Authority says a government research team will survey hundreds of desert caves near the Dead Sea. And this is the same location where the world's oldest biblical manuscripts were discovered in 1947. The collection is considered the crown jewel of the Israeli antiquities. Gwen Ifill, veteran journalist and co-anchor of PBS NewsHour, has died of cancer. Ifill was a part of the first female anchor team at PBS. She took a leave from her nightly show for health reasons earlier this year, but never made her illness public. A week ago, she went out on leave again, taking her away from election night coverage. Over her career in news, Ifo worked for NBC News and PBS. She also moderated two vice presidential debates. She was 61. Coming up, Vid Angel under fire. Why Hollywood heavyweights are trying to shut down the family-friendly company. The Disney Company is leading a legal battle against a streaming service that allows families to filter the entertainment they watch in their own homes. 
The judge heard arguments in that case against VidAngel Monday. Disney is seeking a preliminary injunction, essentially asking a judge to shut down the operation before the case goes to trial. Ephraim Graham is following this story. The men and women in this room are affectionately called angels. They're the engine behind VidAngel, the family-friendly streaming service that lets customers block objectionable material from their favorite entertainment. Having young children and w wanting the, the product for our own families, that's what, that's what drove it, because the product didn't exist. Neil Harmon is a husband and a father of young children and one of the creators of the service. You buy a movie, a favorite popular movie or TV show, and once you own it, you can legally set filters. You can filter it for uh, racial slurs, for sexual language, for violence, for nudity, and uh, just according to whatever your preferences are. And then you can watch the movie exactly according to your specifications in your home. Users can then sell that selection back to VidAngel for credit towards another, making it possible to watch a movie for one to two dollars. We've been testing it for some time. We officially launched in August of 2015. VidAngel was born here in Provo, Utah, not far from the Sundance Film Festival. And the filtering service company was slapped with a lawsuit from Hollywood Studios less than a year after starting. So far as we can tell, they want to put VidAngel out of business. David Quinto is VidAngel's attorney, leading its fight against the lawsuit from Disney, Lucasfilm, 20th Century Fox, and Warner Brothers. And he's quite familiar with the industry. He spent nearly 30 years working for Hollywood Studios before signing on with VidAngel. We've called the court's attention to the fact that 40,000 people voluntarily donated money to VidAngel's legal defense fund without getting anything in return. VidAngel supporters have invested $10 million for its legal defense, written more than 8,000 support letters and more than 16,000 emails. Do you think it loses punch by moving to the Death Star metaphor there? The company's creative team is also hard at work on fun ways to make their case even clearer to those customers. There's a feeling in the air and a sense um, among the people who use VidAngel that um, justice is, is on our side, ultimately. We just need to get there. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Provo, Utah. Monday's hearing is the first for this case, but a full trial may not come for another year. Up next, Hacksaw Ridge, the resurrection, and an exclusive interview with Mel Gibson. Here are his latest plans for his next big project. Welcome back. Mel Gibson's new movie, Hacksaw Ridge, is getting rave reviews, being called one of the most realistic war movies ever made. The film, based on the true story of the heroism of Desmond Doss, a man of faith who joined the military during World War II but refused to carry a weapon. Our Wendy Griffith sat down with Gibson to discuss the movie and what some are calling his big comeback. Now, what was it about the life of Desmond Doss and his story that made you say, I want to make a movie about this? Well, it was a very compelling story. and. Uh it's undeniable. I mean, the man went into the worst place on earth, you know, the Battle of Okinawa, which was the largest loss of life in the Pacific Theater. And uh, it was the epicenter of, you know, war as hell, they say. And uh, he, he went there armed with nothing but faith. He refused to touch a weapon or take a life. But what he did do was save lives. And he risked his life to save those lives. So, yeah. you know, as they say, you know, in, in the Bible, you know, the greater love hath no man that he lay down his life for his friends. And Desmond demonstrates this, not just once, yeah. you know, over and over, very consciously too. Talk about how does your own personal faith help inspire the movies you pick, the roles you pick? Well, I don't know. I, I read this script and I saw somebody like Desmond Doss, and it makes me uh, uh, painfully aware of how scant my own faith is. You know, when, when, you, when you look at a guy like this whose faith is complete, I mean, imagine being able to crawl into enemy fire for your brother and, and save a life. 
you know, and and uh, um, I don't know if I could do that. I'd want a weapon at least if I was even going to think about something like that. You did such a great job of making his faith important without making the movie preachy. Was that a fine line to walk? Well, I think it just is. Um, and we put him in a real world, as he was, with real soldiers in a real bad situation. And it's kind of like, you know, I was talking before about you know, it was kind of like introducing a Norman Rockwell painting to an Anonymous Bosch painting and introducing the characters from the Saturday Evening Post into these, you know, yeah. horror paintings uh, of war. It's like stepping on innocence, as it would have been, you know. Ready? Yeah. Let's go. We got company. Come on. The, the war scenes are so real, uh, it's hard to watch sometimes, but uh, you felt that was important to make it very... I did. Yeah. To uh, emphasize not only this, his faith and how strong it must have been to be able to walk into that, yeah. uh, but uh, also to, to, uh, to honor our veterans, you know, I think, and, and to give a real picture of what it is they must have endured. Now, I probably never get close to the real thing, but mm -hmm. I think you might get an impression or an idea and maybe the audience member feels like they're in a foxhole. Oh, uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mel, there's a lot of buzz going around that Hacksaw Ridge is Oscar-worthy and that this is Mel Gibson's big comeback. comeback uh, yeah. How does that feel to hear? Well, I suppose it's always nice. Uh, I didn't know I'd gone anywhere, but there you go. Um, but, it, but it's good. I mean, look, if you do something that's undeniable and it works, it's very gratifying to get the feedback on that. And, you know, I'm hearing very positive things. So, you know, hey, I'm happy about that. I mean, if you're a chef and you make a cake, you want people to eat it, right? And you want them to go yum, yum. You don't want them to spit it out and run away. So it's, uh, exactly. it's the same with filmmaking. It's another art. So. Do you think um, do you think Hollywood's forgiven you for past mistakes? Well, I think so. I mean, it's ten years ago, and it uh, you know, in in truth, um, wow, you know, in the back of a police car, a couple of double tequilas, and uh, you know, probably having a breakdown. You know, it's a moment in time, <laughs> and uh, you know, none of my actions actually sort of. Uh, bear up the label that was slapped on me from the one incident. So it's, uh, you know, it's 10 years. I've worked a lot on myself. I'm doing great. I'm happier and healthier than I have been in a long time. And it's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's good, you know. Yeah, let's talk about the beard. Um, it's getting longer, it's getting bigger. Is this is this just for personal fun or is this for a role? No, I'm working, I'm working. It's like I'm, I'm working in uh, Dublin <laughs> and, and making a film over there and it's about a man from the 18th century, hence, you know, the beard. Oh, seriously? So, oh, yeah. seriously? Oh, no, oh I didn't know. It's an acting know. gig. Yeah, no, you wouldn't. Come on, this is roadkill. I have to, uh, you know, roadkill with teeth. <laughs> so I've got to, I've got to, um, yeah, I wouldn't do this on purpose. Christmas is coming. I might deliver you a bag of coal, but you need to take <laughs> yeah, care of it. Well, I'm coal. from West Virginia. I love coal. All right, there you We're go. We're the coal state. The coal state. Okay. It's no secret, Mel, you are working on a sequel to The Passion. Why, why make a sequel? Well, because it's called the resurrection of, you know, you can't do the passion again, but you, you see the fruits of that. So it's a, a, an interesting, uh, um, it's, it'll be interesting what we come up with. Well, the Bible talks some about the resurrection, sure. of course, um, but not a lot. Is that going to make your job easier or harder? I think both, because mm, you have to juxtapose that incident against many other things. See, it doesn't make sense unless it's in context with, or in concert with many other things. Exactly, but you're excited about it. Yeah, I think it's gonna be pretty interesting. And, 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 you know, there's no point in doing it unless you can shed some kind of theological light. I'm working with Randall Wallace, and we've been, we've been just like chin-wagging about it a lot. And, you know, there's a lot of theology attached to this event. I mean, it's a pretty big deal. I mean, who gets killed in public and then gets up three days later and appears to people everywhere and then you know, starts a whole thing. It's, nobody ever did that. Do you feel like a lot of pressure, you know, to make this, well, as biblical as possible, but still to make it believable? Absolutely, yeah. You have to get, you have to um, have it be effective and emotional, and it has to be compelling, and it has to be, come from a truthful place. Yeah. Now, I'm not quite sure even where we're gonna get to with it, 
but observations will happen. And Randy and I, like, we're always coming up with stuff that's blowing our minds. So is this, is this a, a good time in your life? Absolutely. I'm, I couldn't be happier. I mean, I'm happier and healthier now than I've ever been, and it's just great. I'm fortunate um, and, and grateful to be able to do what I love doing, and that's telling stories and making pictures. And yeah, well, I feel very fortunate to have had this time with well, you. Well, thank you so much, yeah. CBN Israel is helping single mothers and children in the Holy Land. The CBN staff recently held six dinners throughout Israel. The dinners included good food, fellowship, worship, and family counseling. Food vouchers were also given to single moms for the holiday season so they could celebrate the Jewish New Year known as Rosh Hashanah. CBN Israel also blessed one woman who needed serious help with financial blessing, financial planning, and basic household needs. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. That's it for now on CBN Newswatch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care about most at cbnnews.com. And tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here. You can do that on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.